And now we have the wonderful invitation to recite together that amazing passage that we know as the 23rd Psalm. We will recite it slowly and with purpose. The purpose being that there is a word in this for you and for me. Would you care to stand and join me as we carefully, intentionally speak together the words of the psalmist? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Take just a moment and let that word resonate in your heart. Let the Spirit of God speak to you now. What only He knows you need to hear. Lord, we give you thanks. Oh, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor for all that you have done, but more importantly, for all that you are, for who you are. The Lord, our shepherd, our protector, our guide, our savior, our defender, our provider, our father, our brother, our friend. Our words fail us, Lord, to convey all that you are, and yet our hearts now are open to you, and we ask, O oh, word, that you would continue to speak, living, cut through our hearts, and pierce us, Lord, in the deepest part of who we are, that we might know you, that we might walk in your ways to the glory of your name. It is to you we give thanks and we give praise and we come now eager to hear and receive. Speak, O oh Lord, as you have been and as you will be faithful to continue. In the name of one through whom you've made it all possible, in the name of Jesus, we ask it. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated, you may be seated. Today, we are going to start a new series, you might call it, but it's a series that has a very intentional purpose. And many of you on your way in, you got one of these, this 30 days of thanks. It's a 30-day intentional devotional study that we are going to be doing as a church together for the month of November, which I know it's hard to believe begins tomorrow. 
But if you haven't got one of these yet, that's okay. You can definitely pick one up on your way out. We also have it available online, digitally, in, in uh, all kinds of formats there for you, which we'll share again toward the end of, of the message here. I just wanted to mention it now, and I'll talk to you about it in more detail at the end of the sermon. But um, I'm so excited about this. And we're so grateful how uh, the pastoral team was able to get together uh, several weeks ago and, and talk about what does it look like for us to grow into a thankful people. Not that we're, hopefully, hopefully we already are thankful in many ways, but how do we grow even more so? How do we become a people with an attitude of gratitude every day? I, I don't know about you, but some of the most joyful people I know are also the most grateful people I know. Anybody else testify to that? Right, it's so true. And, and I don't think it's a coincidence those two things go together. And so today, and, and as we move forward into November, we're going to be talking about what does it mean to be a thankful people? How do we grow to become more thankful people, even and especially in times like these where so many people are, are so angry, so frustrated, so uh, just, just distracted by so many things where gratitude seems to be one of the last things anybody talks about. But as the people of God, it needs to be different. For the people of God, it must be different. And so as we walk through this, uh, you'll notice, and I'll talk more about it at the end, but each week there is a theme. And today we're going to be talking about God's provision and thanking God for his provision. That's week one. The next week we'll move into what does it mean to thank God for community, which we got to celebrate in such a beautiful way yesterday. Week three is how do we thank God for his church, what it means to be part of the family of faith that he's called us to. Week four is thanking God for God's self. The greatest gift is actually the giver. And that's going to lead us right into Advent, that season when we remember and we honor and we celebrate the greatest gift of all, which we've been doing all morning, which is the gift of Christ himself, right? And so this is going to be a journey. Our sermons on Sundays are going to connect with what we've been looking at and what we'll be looking toward in the next week. So I'm hoping that you will follow this with us. Again, I'll say a couple more things about that toward the end. But... Uh, Psalm 138, we began today, Pastor Sean led us in our call to worship with this opening psalm. You remember that first verse? I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Do we? With our whole heart? What does it mean to do anything with your whole heart? with the wholeness of who you are. When the scriptures talk about our heart, uh, 800 times throughout the Bible, the word heart is used, and it never has to do with that actual organ that pumps blood on the left side of your chest. It's always about the very center of who you are. Are, the very core of your being. That is how the ancients understood what it meant to, to speak of your, your heart, the heart of who you are, the heart of, of what kind of person you are. And so with your whole heart, it means nothing is held back, nothing is reserved, nothing is, is put to the side. But sometimes, if we're just totally honest, when it comes to something like, like giving thanks to God, when it comes to gratitude, when it comes to appreciation, when it comes to these things, if we're honest, we're thankful. But maybe not so much with our whole heart. Am I right? So the question is, what gets in the way of giving thanks? What gets in your way of giving thanks? What kind of barriers do you experience in your own heart that keep you from being able to give with your whole heart thanksgiving to God? Have you ever asked yourself that question? It's so important that we do. I think maybe one of the, the, the first places is something we call focus. Some of you are adjusting your glasses right now saying, what is that? Here's a question I wanna ask you. What happens when we focus on what we don't have rather than what we do have? What happens when we focus not on who we are but on who we wish we were? 
What happens when we get distracted and our focus is not on who it should be upon or where it should be upon, but instead we focus on what we lack rather than on what we have been given? There's a story from the journey of the Israelites through the wilderness, and it comes to us from Numbers chapter 11. And just real briefly, to share just a couple of verses from that story. This is where the people have been moving on now from Mount Sinai and and they've experienced this miraculous division from from bondage and slavery uh, by the hand of God, led by Moses. And and now as they're moving through the wilderness and they had wondered, how are we going to drink? And God had provided the water. They're wondering, how are we going to eat? And God had provided this miraculous substance called, called manna. But here we are, by the time we get to chapter 11, and we read these words. And the Israelites wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. Now, wait a minute, pause there. The fish we used to eat in Egypt. What were they in Egypt? Slaves, Slaves. but man, we don't remember that. We had fish and then they go on. The cucumbers, the melons. The leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Now you're thinking, man, what's the big deal about leeks and onions and garlic? But what do those things do? They flavor your food, right? You ever had chicken that's not seasoned? I mean, I'm, I'm thankful for chicken, but, but if you've had a roast chicken that's not seasoned, what are you thinking about the whole time you're eating that chicken? This thing needs some salt. It needs some pepper. Needs a little garlic salt, maybe. We, I mean, this, this is what we're thinking. Of. So they say the leeks, the onions, the garlic, but now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Just a short while ago, this manna was the miracle from God. It was the unbelievable gift that was to nourish them, and they knew this, through their journey through the wilderness. And now they're like, man, I wish I had some garlic salt. Do you see what's happening? And we love to pick on ancient Israel, don't we? We love to read those Old Testament stories and say, oh, those poor, poor people. They didn't know what they didn't know and blah, 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 blah. But we are just like them. We are them. Today we call it FOMO. You know what that is? Fear of missing out. It's when you sit and you scroll through social media for two hours and you don't even realize that much time has passed and all you feel like is is like you've been hit by a truck afterwards. Emotionally, you're you're just wrecked. And you're like, what is this? And you're like, oh, I'm looking at everybody else's life, everybody else's marriage, everybody else's perfect kids, everybody else has lost 40 pounds in the last two days, everybody else has got a new job, everybody else just got a brand new car, and my life stinks. And you're like, how, how do I get to be a part of what all of those other people are doing? That, that's a real thing in our day and age that's no different than thinking about and focusing upon all these other things that supposedly you don't have, can't do, can't be. It's the same thing. So whether it's in our relationships, whether it's in our, 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 our situations that we're experiencing, these are things that are real barriers to being thankful. Because if you are suffering from fear of missing out, you're not going to be thinking about being grateful for who you have. Not at all. That leads us to another, even better, uh, more specific thing that is connected to this idea of, of having our focus in the wrong place, and that is what we call comparison. You want to become unthankful or ungrateful in a hurry? Start comparing yourself to everyone and everything. Theodore Roosevelt said, Comparison is the thief of joy. It's also the thief of gratitude, no question. Because here's what's happening. You know, I want to show you a picture. Can we fill that one there, Bryant? (laughs) You were that little guy on the right, or the left, I should say. That's who you were, right? You got this, you got a sweet ride and you're so thankful and this is great and you're feeling awesome and this, oh man, life is good. I, I'm so grateful God has provided this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful gift in my life. And then you're at the stoplight and guess who pulls up next to you? Old number two. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're like, what in the world? And now you're looking at, you know, could be your car, could be whatever, but you're looking at your, looking at your marriage and then you're, oh, 
you're looking at your career or your call, and you're like, mm. but no. And comparison starts to, before you even know what's happening, it is robbing you of whatever gratitude you had, of whatever joy you had, of whatever uh, just contentment and peace in your heart, in your life that you thought you knew. Proverbs 14, verse 30 says it this way, a sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Comparison in the scriptures, we often hear the word envy uh, used to refer to the same principle. It is so hard to be grateful when we are envious of one another. Psalm 37 says this, do not fret. That's the older translation. Don't, don't worry. Don't be incensed or displeased or, or angry. Quit comparing yourselves to others for any reason. The psalmist says, don't worry. Don't envy. Trust in the Lord and do good because then you will live safely in the land and prosper. And you all know this verse. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oftentimes we quote that verse and we think, well, man, I want to, you know, have this or I want to be that or I want to go there. And so if I just, you know, God's going to give me the desires of my heart. That's not what that verse is saying. Take delight in the Lord. What it means to be taking delight in the Lord means to make yourself pliable with. It's the same language you would use to talk about how two lovers interact with one another. Make yourself intimate with the Lord. Make yourself available to the Lord in such a way as that when you are in that relationship with God, guess what? The desires of your heart are going to align with the desires of his. And God delights in giving his children the desires of their hearts that are in alignment with who he is his nature, his character, because guess what? His desires for you, his desires for me are the best for us. Now, some of you are stopping right now, and I know you're thinking to yourself, well, well Ben, that's fine, but, but what about other things that get in the way of, of being grateful, other things that get in the way of being thankful? And we need to talk some more about that, and we will here in a moment, because what about when we've been hurt We've been abused. Pastor Greg already mentioned, what about when we can't trust? We can't trust people and we definitely can't trust God. The question we have to ask is, is how do we nurture a thankful heart? How do we do this? If we want to be more thankful and yet it's hard, it's difficult, it's one of those things where like, Ben, this is what I want to do, but there's these barriers, there's these roadblocks, there's these things in the way that keep me from doing that. Well, we talked about what happens when our focus is the wrong place. We need to remember where does our focus need to be placed? Not just on what, but more importantly, upon whom. And this is why all morning long we've been focusing upon Psalm 23 over and over and over again. So if you're there, if you have your Bibles or your phone, whatever you got, scroll there, turn there <laughs> with me. Because this passage, which is so familiar to so many of us, it is so vitally important. And the danger becomes that it becomes too familiar, too cliche. And perhaps, you know, you think of it, oh, Psalm 23, that's the psalm that somebody reads at a funeral. That's the psalm that we always do at the graveside service. And, and in our culture, unfortunately, even in our media, sometimes that's how Psalm 23 is represented. That's how it's portrayed. But it is so much more than just a psalm we share at the end of this life and the beginning of the life that is to come. So much more than that. This is a passage in scripture that's meant to talk about trusting God. Sharing with us what it means to live a God-centered life. It's about so much more than simply about death. So very much more. The imagery we have here is that of a sheep and a shepherd. And later on, it's an honored guest in a banquet and an incredibly gracious host. So much of the time we talk about collectively us and we as the people of God, and we need to do that. That's so important. But today I want you to understand and hear and meditate upon this psalm individually. The Lord is my shepherd. 
The Lord is your shepherd. Think about just you and you alone. Because remember what I said, delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in him, the one who is your shepherd, your protector, your provider. What do shepherds do? They guide and they direct and they lead. And when we stray and we get off course, they bring us back to where we are meant to go and they don't drive us from behind. Ancient shepherds would lead from the front. And our Lord is one who has, there's nowhere we can go where he has not gone before even into death itself. When we get to that part, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, who has been there before me? The shepherd. Who is with me, even in the midst of that valley? The shepherd. And so let's talk a little bit about, in the time we have left this morning, who that shepherd is. I shall not want. I shall not want. Now, right now, you may have something that you're waiting on, something that you need in your life, something you were desiring in the depth of your being, and you know it's not wrong, you know it's not sinful, and you're asking God, why hasn't this come to pass? Why haven't you brought this? I, I, I need this for my family, or, or, or this loved one needs to be healed, or there's something in me, Lord, that I'm asking you to deal with, and yet you don't seem to be doing it as I think you should in the timing or the way that I think you should. Lord, have mercy. This year, I, I know so many stories, so many in my own life, uh, personally, that that, that that just continues to come. So many people are asking questions, asking questions and, of God and, and of one another in this way. I shall not want. That statement will make no sense if we do not remember and constantly remind ourselves of who the shepherd is. Our faith is not in each other. Our faith is absolutely not in ourselves. Our faith is not in any mortals, any circumstances, any bank account, any talents or gifts or abilities or any of that. And I hope and pray that in the last year and a half, as so many of those things were either taken away or, or were revealed to be just shifting sand upon which we cannot stand, I hope and pray that that has driven us deeper into understanding the one who is the only one that we can build our lives upon as he is the one who leads us, guides us, directs us as our shepherd. Some of you feel like you're walking through the wilderness right now. We talked about ancient Israel, right? Complaining about not having all these things that they wanted rather than what they did have, which was God's miraculous provision in this, this food called manna. But there's other accounts in the Old Testament. We read of it in, in, in Nehemiah chapter 9 where, where Israel lacked nothing in the wilderness, the prophet says. He says, you may feel like you're in the wilderness now, right? But, but, but Israel, their clothes didn't wear out in that journey. Their sandals didn't wear out. They had what they needed. And even though it wasn't always what they wanted, God was providing exactly what they needed to get them where they needed to go. Some of us are in that place right now. It does not mean God is holding out on you. God is being faithful and he is bringing you to where he needs you to be. The question is, will you trust him in the journey? Will you trust him along the way? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Both of these images are images of rest, of peace. His direction, his leading. We can rest in these things because he is the good shepherd. He can be trusted. He is the one that we can know is always working for our good. Always working for our good. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That word for restore, it's the same word in the Old Testament we translate elsewhere as, as repent. He is turning back my life. One Hebrew scholar defines it as, he, he, my life he brings back. Do you know him as the restorer? of your life, the restorer of your heart. This image in Hebrew is, it, it, it's someone who's almost stopped breathing and then is brought back 
to life. Have you been there? Have you been there? Where almost everything in you feels like, at least in a spiritual sense, you feel like you are that close to dying. It might come through grief and loss. It might come through horrendous injustice that you've suffered or someone who was supposed to love you or supposed to care for you exploited you, abused you, left you. It might be that you were, everything that you thought you had was, was all taken. There was something that went south in, 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 in your career or in your business and all of a sudden everything you had to been depending upon for security and provision, it's gone. And yet here David still says, this is the one, the shepherd is the one who brings my life back for his name's sake. Do you know what that means? He does this for his reputation. He does this for his own purposes when it comes to defending who he is. Do you know what the name Jesus means? We sang that song and it means healing and it means trust and it means all, all these things. It's wonderful. But the word Yeshua in, in Hebrew, we translate that better in English as Joshua. In, in Greek, it's Jesus and then we translate that into Jesus in English. The word means God is salvation. The name Jesus means God saves. For his name's sake, he leads me in right paths. He will put me back no matter how I have strayed, no matter who has led me astray, no matter who I have followed that was not him. He will bring me back. He will lead me in because he is faithful not only to me, he is faithful to who he is. But we got to know who he is, church. Because right now in a world where everyone is desperate to figure out who they are in all kinds of crazy, crazy ways, we will go astray in every single possible way possible if we don't know who he is first. What a blessing it is. What a privilege it is for our lives to be those that God has called. Those that he, as, as Christopher said, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. And as you learn from me and get to know who I am, guess what? You will come to know who you are. That's the word that the church has to not only proclaim, but has to live in the world today. Because we are a world that does not know who we are. We don't know whose we are. And we will be led astray by so many other shepherds that attempt to direct and attempt to lead and attempt to guide us. But like Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He's talking about wrong shepherds in that passage in John chapter 10. But he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He restores life to his sheep. He leads them in the right way, the way they should go, so that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And this next line is the very center of the psalm. It's the very center of the psalm. For you are, what? With me. When you read the Psalms, it's sometimes hard to see in English, but in Hebrew, it's much more clear. They're, they're, they're structured. The, the, the poetry, the artistic input is amazing. And the very center line of Psalm 23 is, for you are with me. Eugene Peterson calls it the emotional center of the psalm. Even in those circumstances, even when we are, the, the shadow of death is all around us, even when it looms over us, I will fear no evil, David says. Why not? Because why should I? If the good shepherd is with me, he has promised he will never leave me. He has promised he will never forsake me. He has been, as we can say on this side of the cross, he has been in and through the valley. As we sang, whom then shall I fear? 
because you never let go of me. This is good news. This is a blessing not only to hear, but more so to live because he has promised he would not only lead us into the valley, he would lead us through that valley. He is not going to leave you there. He is not going to leave me there. So whether I am restored in this life or brought into eternal life with him on the other side of the valley, either way, I have nothing to fear. And in a world that is crippled not only by not having any concept of our identity, but also crippled by fear, again, this is good news, my friends. The joy that comes from living without fear, not because you're invincible, but because you know who God is and you know who he is as your good shepherd. You know who he is as your savior. You know who he is as the one who knows you better than you know yourself. You know what it means to delight yourself in the Lord and you start to experience what we've been experiencing in worship all morning, that intimacy that comes only through our relationship with him. There is no fear that can overwhelm you in that. And so whatever we face, again, I'm not talking about just trying to drum up courage. Our courage is not in ourselves. Our faith is not in ourselves. It's in him. No matter what we face, we are comforted. His rod, his staff. Do you know what a shepherd's rod does? It's a club. Not to beat the sheep, the club is there to protect the sheep, to fend off predators, to fend off thieves who come to steal and kill and destroy. The staff, a shepherd's staff, which we're more familiar with, is meant to guide, it's meant to direct, it's meant to, that crook on the end, you know what that's for? When a sheep has strayed and to hook around the leg, pull back in, how many times has God needed to do that in your life? I can't count how many times God's had to do that in mine. To bring us back on course, on the right path, the paths of righteousness to follow him. And that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is where the language of David, it, it shifts. So where is this happening? Right there in the valley of the shadow. Here is this gracious host. Think about a shepherd perhaps maybe, and he's here in the valley and he brings what he has together and offers this lavish banquet to his honored guest. That is how God sees you. That's how God sees me. And even in the midst of all the things that surround us, even in the midst of all of our difficulties, all of our fears, all of our enemies, God provides the ultimate hospitality. You anoint my head with oil. My cup, as, as a good host in ancient times, it, it, it overflows. It never runs out of wine. You are going to continue to provide all of these things to lay out this banquet. Stop and think for a moment what it means to know God in this way. He is the good shepherd, but he is the most gracious and generous host. As part of that, hospitality means protection. It means safety from enemies. You weren't a very good host in ancient Israel if guests could not relax, if they could not rest, if they could not trust that they were safe in your home or while they were dining at your table. Tim Keller said this in his, he has a devotional on the Psalms. It's called the Songs of Jesus. And writing about Psalm 23, he said this. He said, God has a celebration meal with us, not after we finally get out of the dark valley, but in the middle of it, in the presence of our enemies. He wants us to rejoice in him in the midst of our troubles. Is our shepherd out of touch with reality? Hardly. Jesus is the only shepherd who knows what it is also like to be a sheep. He understands what we are going through and he'll be with us every step of the way, even through death itself, where all other guides turn back. I love that. For surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That translation is so lame. Surely goodness and mercy shall chase me down. That's the real translation. Surely goodness and mercy shall hunt me down. They shall pursue me. They shall chase me down all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God takes this role of the shepherd so seriously. 
so vitally. In just a few minutes we have left here, I want to make sure that you understand how this is something that has been fulfilled in Jesus and continues in and through him in a way that's meant to be understood as as such a broader story than just yours and mine. That's the beauty of God. He is so concerned with every single hair on your head, every single fiber of your being, and yet this story is so much bigger than you or me. The prophet Ezekiel, God speaking through him to ancient Israel, talking about how God was going to bring his people back, how God himself was going to be the one who would make sure He says this, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. This is God speaking. And I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Now we love all the parts about, you know, seeking the lost, binding up the weak, the injured, But that part about the fat and the strong, what is Jesus doing or God is doing, I should say? He's not body shaming. He's not doing anything of the sort. He's talking about leaders in ancient Israel that had grown fat and strong, so to speak, because they took advantage of and exploited the weaker sheep. And God has promised that he will bring justice. So many people that I listen to today, so many people that, 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 that want to come and, and spend time and we, we break bread or we, we share a cup of coffee and they'll say things like, just like Pastor Greg had shared, when it comes to trusting God, they're like, I want to, Ben. I know I'm supposed to, but I, I can't. I can't because of all that I have been through and the suffering that I have known and what my family did to me or, or the grief that I have known and how much loss has happened in my life. How can I trust him? Everything I knew, everything I loved, everyone I loved is gone. Everything I valued most was taken from me. How are we supposed to give thanks in those circumstances? I don't want to be flippant. I don't want to be cliche. This isn't about a sermon beating anybody up because you should be more thankful. It's not that. The answer is always what the answer is. It is how do we continue to call out to the shepherd, the one who seeks us even more than we are seeking him, even more than we are seeking him. Jesus said this in John chapter 10. We've already quoted this, but... He said, the thief is the one who comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come. I am here that you may have life. You may have it abundantly. And now remember the words of the prophet. Remember what Ezekiel, God had said through him. Now Jesus says, centuries later, he says, I am the good shepherd. This is God bringing that promise to fulfillment. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I know my own and my own know me. So how do we grow an attitude of gratitude? How do we become a thankful people, even in the midst of injustice, even in the midst of great and tragic loss. And some of you know all too well what I'm talking about. Some of you, this is describing where you are today. There's no question. When we allow ourselves to take God at his word, that he is the good shepherd, that he does want what is best for you And God is not to be blamed for all of the sin and sorrow and suffering that part of existence in this world entails. Human beings do terrible things to other human beings. Do you know what I'm saying is the truth? And too many of us bear the scars, whether they're on the outside or whether they're on the inside, or both. But he is the one who will never leave you or forsake you. He is the one who makes a table for you in the presence of your enemies, including death and suffering, sorrow, grief, abuse. He is the one who has promised he will not leave you in the wilderness. He will not leave you in the valley of the shadow of death. He will lead you through it. 
somebody needs that word of hope, that word of encouragement today. There are too many people who are too broken, who are too hurting, who yearn to trust God in a way that they feel they cannot right now. If you will do one thing and turn to him and admit that to God, you can't hide that from him anyway. And you ask him, say, Lord, if you will, please allow me to trust you as my shepherd, the one who can lead me through no matter what it is I may face. That is a prayer that God will answer. That is a prayer that God will respond to. That is a prayer that God will move toward. And so today, as we wrap up things, that's why this is so important. One of the best ways to grow in our gratitude is to practice. We have to regain our focus or maybe just have our focus put in the right place if we've never had it before. And so like I said, we're going to start and it starts tomorrow and uh, the forward of this on page one talks about, it says a wise person once said an attitude of gratitude may not change the world, but it sure can change us and the way we live in the world. Even in hard things, even in suffering, even in grief or loss. But if we will give it time and practice and prayer, we can become a more thankful people. And that's what our intention is. That's what our goal is in this next 30 days, Christ Church, is we want to become that together. And so starting today, starting tomorrow is November 1st, actually. Hard to believe. But there is dedicated devotional material here that I want us to be sharing in together. We will not only read it, but pray it. There are prompts for reflection, prompts for, for prayer response. This is something that I want us to be doing as a church, and we, want, we need to pay attention. How will God be working in us? How will God be changing us? How will God be making us a more thankful people as we grow in our trust of him and in our thankfulness to him. If you need to download this online, you can do it. You can see the prompts on the screen. You absolutely can do that. We'll have on social media daily prompts every day, so you can follow along that way if you prefer. Also, you can subscribe to our email list, and we can email the PDF to you in digital format uh, if that's what's best for you. But if you're with us here in person, just make sure you pick up a book. Like, get one of these. Call me old school. I like to do it that way. Get one of these with you as you leave if you haven't got one already. And I, I cannot wait to see and hear and, and, and be talking about it. Talk with each other. Share what God is doing, what God is revealing, how God is at work in your heart, in your family, in your life, in and through this time. So will you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful. We are a thankful people, Lord, but help us become even more so a thankful people as this 30 days of thanks before us begins to unfold. Lord, you are faithful and you are good. And even when we seem to be facing the valley, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, we shall fear no evil because you are with us. So Lord, right now, whoever needs your touch in a way that brings encouragement, brings hope, no matter what they are facing, Lord, they may be overwhelmed right now by fear, by sickness, by anxiety, by grief or loss. They may be trying to figure out how to deal with the situation, Lord. They have no earthly idea how to respond to. Lord, be our shepherd. Give direction, give guidance, give protection. Lord, thank you for your provision, not just with food and drink, but with your spirit to guide us and lead us. And so Lord, let us this day take great joy in the truth that you are our shepherd and we shall not want because of who you are and because we are yours. Praise God. In the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. And all God's people said, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen, amen. Go in peace, let us love and serve the Lord with thanksgiving.